let us call sandeep for the next topic shark sandeep is the primary author of shark and product engineer as palivo so please welcome sandeep on the stage I'm Sandeep. Uh, I work as a product engineer at Plevo. Uh, so the product engineering team at Plevo is uh, basically concerned with you know building uh, services which uh, talk to the core telephony component. So that's what we do. And I'm also the basic. Uh, I mean, I'm also the primary author of Shark. So that's what we'll be talking today: the rate limiting queuing system which we build and which we are open sourcing today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Moving on. So the problems, right? Uh, any 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 web services which is deployed on the cloud has uh, has has these two main problems. The first one is uh, 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 unpredictable uh, traffic spikes on the cloud infrastructure. So generally, what we do is uh, we kind of uh, plan for capacity, right? I mean, when you when you have a uh, uh, cloud infrastructure running, you uh, plan like 1.5x or 2x generally of your peak traffic, and you say, okay, this is uh, what my infrastructure is going to be, and you. Uh, you know, you you work out of that. Uh, but what what if uh, consider a scenario where uh, let's assume uh, you suddenly get a, a very high spike, like you know, uh, uh, maybe your average request is 10 per second, and then then suddenly like you know within the next five seconds it increases to like thousand per second. How how do you handle that? So that is that is one problem uh, and uh, uh, there are a couple of ways to quickly solve this right the first one would be the first thing which people would think is like you know over provision like you know have uh, a lot of service already in production and then you know you say that okay my uh, infrastructure would be able to handle a lot of traffic traffic already so i need not worry but ki that kind of does not make any business sense right i mean uh, why would you have a very huge cluster just for a minute or two minute spike or not even minute or two uh, it, it kind of uh, is like an overkill because you would be spending a lot of infra uh, uh, money on the infrastructure and it kind of uh, 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 you know, you you would lose a lot of money if you do that. The second thing would be to if you if you are on some uh, infra infrastructure provider like AWS, you would uh, maybe have some auto scaling, something like uh, uh, a mission goes down, it comes up, or when the load increases, it comes up. But again, there is a problem where uh, you know uh, by the time the mission comes up, the spike might have already ruined your your, your entire system. Like you know, it would have uh, had a very bad impact on your system. So uh, th those are the uh, two uh, the two immediate solutions, but they they do not solve the problem. Uh, to give you an example where this might happen, let's consider, a, uh, for example, a data analytics company or something. So what it might do is uh, it might have a set of clients uh, who might be uh, giving out data inputs, say, for example, like Google Analytics or something which would uh, send out uh, page hits uh, to your server. And suddenly, let's assume you, one of your clients goes on the front page of Hacker News or Tech runs, right? It gets featured in TechCrunch, and there's like a sudden spike in traffic, and there's a lot of traffic coming to your infrastructure, and you just need to handle it. So that is one particular use case which you can talk about. The second one is so uh, gracefully, gracefully handling third-party services. Uh, so here, what happens is, uh, I'm sure in mo in most cloud services, we would be using uh, some third-party services, like uh, for example, you would be send, uh, you would be using uh, Mailgun or like you know SendGrid to send out emails, right? So what would happen in such a scenario is is um, that the third party services would actually have a cap on your usage what they say is oh, you okay you can't send more than 300 uh, emails per uh, per minute or per, per hour or whatever they have th those caps so that is one of the, uh, another problem which we face generally so uh, looking looking at the first problem if you if you uh, take a look at a simple architecture which would uh, which would 
uh, represent this. So it basically would have a HTTP server there, and uh, uh, whenever the request comes to the HTTP server, it would uh, forward the request directly to its respective uh, cluster. Like there are, let's assume there is a different service cluster number one, service cluster number two, service cluster number three. So what would happen in this scenario? Like what happens? What would happen in when a spike occurs is uh, represented in the graph. So you, you can you can see that in the uh, in the graph to the left, right? So there is a sudden huge spike on the HTTP server. So uh, uh, beca because of this, because of this spike, you can see that the entire service, uh, because uh, a, a specific service cluster is being impacted very highly, which is the graph to your right. So you can see a clear correlation, right? I mean, as soon as your uh, the, the server which is fronting all your infrastructure gets a high load, then it just forwards all the requests to a particular cluster, and the cluster just you know uh, is suddenly under high load. And uh, what that does is, because of the spike, it affects all the users using that particular cluster. So this is kind of a uh, not so efficient architecture. So uh, th that that is a problem number one. And uh, to illustrate the problem number two, it would be something like this, where uh, there is a third-party service, and you are trying to uh, make a request, and it's again the same problem which I explained. They would have caps, and uh, you would not be able to. Uh, I mean, you might not be able to adhere to their rate limits. So. Now, to think about it, the most simple solution for this uh, would be something like this, like uh, introduce a queue, right? I mean, uh, th th this would solve the basic problem where uh, uh, all the requests are directly sent to the uh, next level of cluster. So what this would do is this queue uh, would basically buffer all the requests, and then it, uh, the service cluster number, service cluster, service cluster two, can pull out these jobs. Uh, depending on their capacity, like you know, if 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 they are ready to accept jobs, it keeps accepting. Or otherwise, it will be in the queue and it can accept at whatever rate it wants. So this this some uh, a very simple system like this can be very easily implemented by uh, some most popular queues. Like for example, Celery, right? You just define a task and you just say, okay, I just uh, need to need this worker to be running in this uh, cluster and the other worker to be running in a different cluster, and then it just pulls jobs. But there is a primary problem with this. The problem is that there is a single queue. So what would happen is, let's assume there is a spike, and the spike is uh, uh, related to a single cluster. Let's assume it is cluster uh, service cluster number one. Uh, what that would do is, that would fill up the queue, and uh, that would slow down the request uh, by people who are trying to make a request to the cluster number two. Right? I mean, there is a single cluster, and all the jobs are in that, and uh, it is basically uh, it is basically causing problems where. Uh, uh, spike in one cluster is also affecting the service performance of the other cluster, right? So to think about it, the easiest solution would be to uh, put two queues, right? So service service queue one and service queue two. So this this would solve that problem. Uh, what this would do is it has two queues, which means uh, it is uh, so the HTTP server when it gets a traffic, it knows that it has to route the uh, uh, request for service number cluster uh, cluster one and puts it in service uh, service one queue and uh, if it's a a request to the service uh, uh, if it's a request to cluster 2 it puts it in the service uh, queue uh, to queue so uh, this again seems to solve the problem it, it it seems to be like a good solution but it is not complete so the problem here is that even though we separated the dependency between two services now we have a problem where uh, it, there is a contention between two users using the same service. Let's assume there is a user who has made like 10,000 requests uh, to uh, service cluster one, and uh, you have 10,000 jobs in the queue. What if there is another uh, user who is making a single request to the same service? Uh, because there is a single queue, you you would put him at the back of the queue, which means that he has to wait until all the jobs are to be completed, right? So that that is uh, one one basic uh, problem with this. So even even this kind of an architecture can be improved implemented very easily with something like celery so what you do is you just define uh, uh, two queues two tasks and then uh, what you do is basically uh, have a worker running in service cluster one and service cluster two connecting to that queue and just pulling out jobs right so um, if you think about it th this still has a problem it's not even like an uh, ideal solution it doesn't solve the problem completely so what you would ideally do is uh, an architecture like this so uh, this is where uh, the shark, the queue which we built, comes into picture. So what this does is it uh, gives you the ability to create queues dynamically. So what you can uh, do is have a per user queue or something, and then set a rate limit on that user queue. So what that would enable you is that uh, you can rate limit on a more granular level, which means that 
uh, let's assume a, a, a user who's making a, who's generating a lot of traffic, like he's, who's uh, generating a spike, will be put in his own queue, like his specific queue with a specific rate limit, and uh, that won't affect all the other other customers or all the other users who are using the same service because each of the customer or each of the user has his own queue. So this is what this is what Shark exactly does. Basically, it uh, creates queues dynamically uh, to ensure fair queuing so that uh, a spike from one user it does not affect the spike from other user and then uh, it, the ability to change the rate limits on the fly and then it gives you a constant flow it just just does not uh, g g give you jobs and bursts it just gives you a constant flow so uh, to give you a glimpse of what shark can do let's let's j uh, dive into a quick hands on demo so i'll just run through the demo what i'll be doing in the demo so uh, I'll, I'll show you a code snippet, basically, like uh, the code which I'll be running. So basically, we'll have a worker listening on a particular, uh, uh, listening on a queue of a particular service type, and um, then we, we, I'll emulate the situation where uh, there is a customer who is generating a, a spike, and uh, then then show you how the queue is able to rate limit and give out jobs at the specified rate limit, and then uh, what we will do is we will emulate the situation where. Uh, even even though the, there are a lot of queues in in that for of that particular service type, I will make a request uh, uh, f uh, by another user and show that the this user request does not get affected because there are already jobs in the queue. So I will show that, and at the end I'll just uh, show you how uh, easy it is to change the rate limit on the fly for the queue. So uh, let's let's dive into the demo. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I just need something to hold the mic or something. I'm, I'm, I'll be showing a code demo, so I just need uh, someone to hold the mic so that I can. Thanks. Uh, hey, once again, I just need the terminal to come. Should I move it or something? Yeah, you can try. Uh, other side. Try this side. Uh, yeah. Shark server has this command with the configuration file, so it just takes a configuration file and uh, once you hit, it starts, uh, starts running, and then. Uh Yeah, so this is a simple worker zip. What it's trying to do is basically uh, running in a while loop uh, so that it's uh, dequeuing jobs from the uh, queue, uh, you know, uh, ev ev at, 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 equal, uh, at uh, uh, every instant. And then uh, there is a, I'm using the request library to make HTTP requests. This queue exposes uh, HTTP APIs for uh, putting the job into the queue and uh, pulling out the job. So uh, there is a HTTP API where uh, you can, uh, so basically in the, in the, f in the, uh, I, what I'm doing is basically doing a uh, DQ operation there, which is uh, slash DQ slash SMS. SMS here is the queue type, which I the service type, right? There are there were two services: service to cluster number one, service cluster number two, and there were like a lot of queues, right? So this is SMS is the one. Le let's assume one of the services, and uh, what it does is it returns uh, if it is a, if the DQ is success, it returns 200, and if uh, if the DQ is uh, DQ fails, it returns uh, 404. So uh, I'm just handling those two cases as it's not like uh, non-blocking you just need to keep on pulling the server for uh, jobs so once I get the job I just uh, 
uh, you know, process the job. Uh, right now, I'm just printing the job and then um, uh, making a finished request. So what finished request means is uh, in the Shark workflow, how it works is um, whenever you enqueue a job, it goes into the uh, it goes into this queue, and then when you do a dequeue, it gives you the job, and then uh, it waits for a particular interval uh, for the confirmation from the worker. So the worker worker once the job is dequeued, the worker needs to confirm saying that uh, the task or the job which it just dequeued is successful. Uh, so that that is the job of the finish request. So finish request is again the same. It just uh, has a slash finish slash uh, the type of the service which is SMS, and then uh, QID and uh, job ID. So QID and job ID are basically the unique IDs which uh, define uh, each customer uh, or in this case customer or user and then uh, job ID is what it defines uniquely uh, each job which you are trying to process. So uh, let's look at a simple uh, script which also uh, enqueues jobs. So what I'll do is I'll just run this and uh, as the shark server is running it'll just uh, keep on polling shark server and waiting for jobs. So let, let's do this and then we'll come back to another script which is basically doing an enqueue. Yeah, so you can see that it's it's polling and it's waiting for jobs uh, uh, again and again, and then uh, we'll go to the other 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 side and let's see the uh, NQ uh, script. Yeah, so what I'm doing is here I'm trying to emulate the uh, scenario where a single user is trying to make a lot of requests. So this is uh, a particular user with ID number one and he's uh, making a request to the service type SMS. And uh, I'm just making a, uh, I'm just inserting 10,000 jobs into the queue uh, on a loop. And uh, there is, you can see in the line number 12, there is a parameter called interval. So what interval does is interval uh, specifies the rate limit of the queue. So what it uh, tells you is that uh, shark, uh, shark server should uh, wait for one second before dequeuing two jobs. So it is basically the inverse of rate limit. So to give you an example, if you want to rate limit this queue to say that Shark should only give out a job of this type uh, with one job per second or something like that, then you would uh, put this as 1000, which means 1000 milliseconds as one second. So this is the inverse of the rate. So you specify that and you specify the payload, which is the actual message which has to go into the queue. And then you just uh, uh, make the HTTP request. So let, uh, let us actually try to make the HTTP request and uh, see how, th how it's being uh, uh, rate limited. Yeah, right. So, so at, at, the right, at the right, you can see that there is a there is a lot of jobs being uh, enqueued, but you can see that it is getting dequeued at a controlled rate. It is getting dequeued at uh, one job per second, right? So it's just it's just waiting, and it's uh, uh, it just waits until that time. The, for example, I mean, uh, the shark server does not give out jobs until it is ready to be dequeued, depending on the rate limit. And then once it is uh, uh, once it is ready, it just dequeues and it is coming out in a controlled rate. Okay, so l l let's uh, now emulate the situation where there are like a lot of jobs already in this queue. Let's emulate the situation where uh, uh, now one more user is trying to make a request and uh, how that uh, how the user is not affected by this. Right, this is this is user number two who is trying to make a same request, uh, same type of request for the same service type. So if you, if you if you, if you just run this, you can see that it's uh, there is two, right? I mean, the, you can see the message that it's saying from from two, right? So so even even though there is a, lo a lot of traffic uh, because of user one, it is not affecting the uh, traffic of the user two. Uh, uh, because because each each of them has their own queue, which is created dynamically, and the rate limit is different for both of them. So uh, this is this is what Shark does. So uh, 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 to show you, to show you one more thing, uh, the ability of Shark to change the rate limit. So what 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 shall we do is uh, this right now is dequeuing at a rate of one uh, job per second, right? So let's let's increase that to uh, I mean let's decrease the rate and say it should only dequeue one job in five seconds. So what I would do is I have we have an uh, it Shark has an internal API uh, using which you can do that. So I'll just show you a quick example.
Yeah, right. So what this is doing is it is of the queue uh, of the service type SMS, and for the user one, it is trying to set the interval of 5,000, which means that one job in five seconds. So that's what it's trying to do. So as soon as I do this, you can see that it starts uh, slowing down. So just now it was uh, dequeuing at a rate of uh, one per second. Now it's dequeuing at a rate of uh, one per five seconds. So this, all this, all this can be done uh, without even any configuration changes. You can just do it on the fly dynamically in real time. So th th that is where Shard comes into picture, and that is how it differentiates itself from all the other existing queues. <laughs> yeah, so let, let's get back to the slides now. Uh, so, yep. So, so you might be guessing uh, already that uh, already that it might be based on this algorithm. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, don't know, the, there is an algorithm called uh, 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 leaky bucket algorithm. So, what the algorithm tells you is that. Uh, it is like a bucket which is leaking water. So what it tells you is that regardless of how sporadic or how erratic your input uh, to your queue is, uh, it should it should uh, be dequeued at a specified average uh, rate limited manner. So you can see that there is a lot of uh, uh, you know. Uh, a lot of lot of drops going into that bucket, and there is like a uh, you know very consistent flow of uh, traffic out of that. So this is shark is based based on this concept. Um, to dig more into the internals. Uh, so uh, sh Shark is uh, built on, uh, Shark has two components, the Shark server and the Shark core. So uh, Shark core implements the base uh, basic uh, uh, logic of rate limiting and uh, Shark server uh, implements the uh, uh, implements a HTTP API over the Shark core. So once again, I'll just remove this. Yeah. So. Uh, the, sh the shark core is basically um, the this, the layer of the uh, queue which talks with the Redis. So we use Redis for uh, storing all the jobs, and then uh, uh, the shark server uses Python Flask and uh, Gevent. Uh, so Flask is used to uh, expose an HTTP API, and Gevent makes it async. And uh, message pack uh, is a serialization format we use to sh uh, make the payload more compact when we store it. So. Uh, once we say Redis, it's like a. Uh, I mean, you might you might be thinking how we might achieve high availability, right? It's kind of uh, uh, in memory and it's uh, uh, it, it is not basically persistent, right? So so uh, this is what we do in production. We have a Shark master and a Shark slave, which is basically like a Redis master and a Redis slave. The slave at any point of time will be uh, having a, a streaming replica of the master, and uh, there is a project called Sentinel, Redis Sentinel, which uh, takes care of automatic failover. So as soon as the master goes down, it automatically promotes the slave so that it is the new master. So that this is how we achieve uh, high availability. So uh, once we have achieved, uh, I mean, Shark is um, the, the, the when we were building Shark, there were two aims. One is uh, achieving high availability, not not because it. Uh, I mean, not not by building. Uh, uh, I mean, Shark doesn't support uh, high availability out of the box, but it is designed in an ar architectural way where uh, it can be deployed. Uh, to get high availability and scalability, so uh, this is how we achieve high availability. High availability uh, for scalability, we what we do is uh, we call that single master slave pair as a shard, and uh, uh, what we do is uh, we have multiple such shards behind a load balancer. So you, if you can if you can see that uh, the producer is. Uh, Enqueuing a job to the load balancer directly without going to the machines, and then uh, there are there is a consumer or worker trying to dequeue the jobs. So there are uh, two caveats here uh, when you deploy Shark in this architecture. The first one is that uh, because the producer uh, does not know how many shards are there, and each shard is independent. Whenever a job is enqueued, it can go to any machine, which means that if the, if you send ten jobs, there can five can be in one machine and five can be in another machine, which means that when it is getting dequeued, the rate can get doubled. So if you say that I want uh, twenty per second, uh, if you use two shards. Uh, it effectively comes out at 40 per second. So at any point of time, the producer should know how many shards are behind the ELB. So th th that that is one caveat. The second one is uh, that the consumer, right? The consumer. Uh, should know where to send the finish request, the confirmation request. So uh, 
the f the f the uh, the DQ happens at the load balancer. I mean, the DQ goes to the load balancer because of which it doesn't know uh, where the where the job initially came from. It can come from mission number one, or it can come from mission number two. And uh, the finished request has to be sent to the same machine, right? If it goes to the different machine, it won't have the job there. So to do that, what DQ does is DQ along with the job uh, returns a IP address. Of that machine from which it was dequeued from, so that the worker can uh, make a request to the machine directly. So you can see the green line there, which is which shows that instead of going to the load balancer, the finished request directly goes to the master uh, master of the particular shard. So uh, that that's how we achieve uh, uh, high availability and uh, scalability. So. Uh, as Shark is open source and uh, we, we uh, and uh, it's available, so we have a, a roadmap here for Shark. So right now, what's available and what's not available? We, it's a new system which we have built, and uh, it is st it is still in its initial stages. But we have been using it in production for a while now. So uh, we uh, uh, we have the NQ API, which is basically to NQ a job. We have a DQ API to get the job out of Shark, and then uh, the finish API to mark the job as success or fail uh, success. And uh, the interval API and metrics API are other APIs where interval API is used to change the rate limit of any queue in real time, and the metrics API uh, gets you a very b br uh, brief uh, uh, metrics. So what we have in uh, pipeline is to build a uh, feature where you can check for jo job status of each job, and then uh, you can have a feature of max retrace or uh, or even extending metrics api to give richer analytics so one thing one thing which is already uh, also missing is uh, the shark client library uh, if you see any queuing system the client library uh, does not have to do much right i mean it just has to uh, connect and uh, uh, dequeue a job but right now in ours you just have to have a loop and with, which does all those dequeues so we already use a, a shark client library in production right now but it's not yet mature to be open sourced so uh, the the pipe uh, it's in the pipeline which we will be open sourcing it very soon and of course as it's an open source project any of your suggestions any of your the improvements which uh, you guys want or any of uh, any of the things which you think is uh, uh, a very good uh, thing to go into shark as a feature would be implemented so um, so Shark is available at shark.io. You can check out the documentation. Uh, you can check out the source code. There are GitHub links, uh, documentation, FAQs. So uh, you can, uh, I think you probably can check out shark.io. Yeah, that's it, guys. I We can have a brief QA session if any of you have any questions. I just want to know, like, uh, uh, how is this Shark server different from this RabbitMQ server? Like, how is it different? What are the advantages of uh, using Sharks instead of RabbitMQ? Yeah, yeah. So probably after after uh, one more one more question. Yeah.
Okay, right, right now the way it's architected, it's architected in a way where uh, the the basic assumption is that the broker is able to take as much as it can. So that is the basic assumption. So uh, also also uh, it, it kind of uh, it it kind of does not make sense, right? I mean, you want a queue to prevent such a scenario. Say for example, you are using this um, uh, for an API or something. Uh, the worst thing would be the worst thing for a customer would be to say that okay, you have exceeded your rate limit. So instead of that, you can just accept and uh, push it into the queue, right? So, so that is the basic problem which we are trying to solve. So, if you try to, uh, if, if you if you try to uh, control the rate limit uh, while you are enqueuing, it means that you have to throw an error back to the uh, user, right? No, uh, via the client API, you can just uh, so it's, so it's basically like TCP back for TCP back for back pressure, right? You tell the client that I cannot uh, process messages beyond this flow window uh, at, at any time. In fact, messages more than this at any time, and it understands the protocol. The only thing that's needed is for the client to understand the protocol and not uh, think that okay, I'm getting back errors and I don't, I don't understand. What's going on. Exactly, I, I I get your point, but but that is what it is trying to solve is what I'm trying to say. So Shark is trying to solve that problem. Shark is trying to say that uh, your resource is not getting overwhelmed. I'll just accept it and push it into the queue and. It will get dequeued at an end, uh, later, later into a uh, later point, later point of time. So, why was the decision, design decision, made to um, start this project from scratch instead of just patching it onto Celery, which is more widely used? That's a pretty good question. So uh, when we evaluated this, right? I mean, when we evaluated Celery to use this, so when we looked at the design of Celery and the way it uses Redis data structures, the inherent design was not rate limiting for Celery. So there was a lot of work involved, uh, which involved like a lot of changes to the internal Celery code, uh, which was kind of risky, right? I mean, uh, you can do that. You can uh, always do that, but it's always best to get away with it as long as you're uh, so it's like going to the danger zone. You need to maintain it on your own, and then you need to make sure that that is bug free and it is not causing regressions on any other part. So that was one thing. And uh, moreover, I, I think it was the basic underlying factor was that it did not the the Celery was not architected in a way to support queues dynamically, to support rate limiting queues dynamically. So that was one reason. Do you intend to support rabbit MQ and priorities? Do you intend to support RabbitMQ as a broker and priorities? Yeah, that's that, 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 that's actually probably a good idea. But uh, I'll tell you why it uh, why it was not possible. So uh, you can use rabbit queues with priority queues, but you, the number of queues you define is constant, right? I mean. Oh, you're saying does sh uh, can I plug in RabbitMQ? Uh, no, right now, no. So right now, sh uh, Shark is uh, uh, heavily dependent on the data structures, underlying data structures for Redis. So right now, there is no support for any other broker uh, except uh, Redis. So you said that you used uh, Lua uh, in your project. With so could you just uh, throw some light on what you use Lua for? Okay, that's actually a pr uh, good question. I it's my bad. I missed the point to say why I am using Lua. So uh, uh, basically, what uh, Redis uh, does is it explores a scripting language uh, called Lua. So uh, uh, so so if you if you see the project, I mean, if you check out the source code, you will be able to see that uh, NQ operation involves a lot of uh, separate Redis operations. I mean, I update a lot of data structures in Redis in a single NQ, which means that uh, I can't be having it. I should be having it in a single transaction. I can't like, you know, have uh, 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 separate uh, Redis commands running over. And then what if uh, that process gets interleaved and there is some other process trying to access Redis, the same data structures that would bring an inconsistency, right? So uh, to make the operations atomic, say, for example, uh, the NQ operation should be atomic saying if there is one NQ going on, there shouldn't be another uh, process which is trying to NQ to Redis. So to achieve uh, such sort of atomicity, uh, we use uh, Lua.
you have dynamic queues uh, yes right so you can create one new site Yeah, so so you're aware that there are like multiple queues and each queue has a rate limit, right? So what we do is uh, um, basically, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how many of you understand uh, Redis data structures, but there is a data structure called uh, sorted set. So what it does is the sorted set uh, uh, takes a value and a score. So what it tells you is uh, that uh, this set can have a value and uh, at any point of time it will be accompanied by a score and it, the score, uh, the values will be uh, at all points of time sorted with respect to score. Right. So at any point of time if you, uh, if you, if you pull the first object it ensures that it is the lowest score in the entire queue. So we use that feature. So what we do is we basically put the queue ID into the as the value and the score as the time at which it should be dequeued. So what the worker does is worker keeps on checking that queue saying that uh, the, is the first job ready, is the first job ready, checking with the current time and then as soon as it is ready it just pulls out the first job and gives it out. You said uh, you have master and slave and use sentinel to really decide election. How does the producer or consumer know which is the master and which is the slave or does it matter where we send the request? Yeah, so this is actually a good question. So if we, if we go back to this, I'm not sure if we have time, so uh, guys, okay, cool. So, Right. If we if we go to this uh, if we go to this architecture, basically, uh, what would happen if the master goes down? Right. At this point of time, uh, the sentinel would kick in, and what it would do is uh, it would uh, uh, find out which slave, if there are multiple, which slave to promote, and then it promotes. So uh, there are there are some things which happen at this point of time that uh, there might be some jobs which are dequeued and uh, which are still pending to send the finished request. So the, the finished request would have the IP address of the old machine, right? Uh, it would not have the IP address. I mean, the machine would just bend down. It would have the IP address of that. So what it would uh, probably do is uh, uh, the claims uh, the claims can be uh, the sentinel. At the end of the sentinel, at the end of the failover process, there is a script which can be run to reconfigure all those things so that the client can be notified saying that, okay, this is the new slave or this is the uh, new server to which you have to make a request request or uh, possibly uh, what, what what can happen is that uh, that that is uh, I think that that is one good approach to do that do the failover process yeah so uh, yeah, so if, if you know, if, if you understand uh, how uh, Redis Sentinel works, right? So Redis Sentinel has like uh, so many uh, Sentinels installed. So the ideal way would be to run Sentinels on each of the claims. So as soon as it knows that uh, the master is down, it does a, a you know, failover, it starts a failover process, promotes a slave to master. And then at the end of the uh, Sentinel, there is a, uh, so there's a script which can reconfigure its own claims. So it'll, it'll anyway be there in all the claims, so it'll reconfigure its claims. So I like the idea of uh, making creation of queue dynamic. burst kind of uh, example right uh, it's not just that there are too many requests but that also sometimes some kinds of bursts are too many clients so if you uh, go to front page of hacker news you have everybody trying to load your home page for example right so you have thousands of clients each trying to make one request so here you will create thousand queues which doesn't really solve the problem
Okay, so uh, the queue destroy uh, process is automatic. So, as if there is no job left, it uh, it just uh, destroys uh, the creation. Right? It depends on. Hello, you able to hear me? Yeah. So, so uh, uh, the queue creation process, right? It depends on your business logic. So, if you if you want the queues, uh, if you you can basically say, for example, you have uh, uh, you're making an API request, uh, and you have, I mean, you you are uh, you have a service which uh, users use to make API request. So, uh, what you can do is probably create new queues for each each user. So, you can have a user ID as the queue name, so that each user will have his own queue. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that so basically on the business logic. So this is one example which I am giving, but depending on the business logic which you have, you can create uh, a number of queues. Yeah. See, in RabbitMQ we have the priorities that has been set for the queues. Likewise, even uh, do we have that here? Uh, priorities uh, that has been set low, medium, and high, which is being uh, which is the default here. Yeah. So there is uh, nothing called as a priority here. So priority is manifested as rate limit. So if you want the uh, this particular uh, queue to have, uh, I mean, this particular queue to dequeue at a higher rate, uh, you can set a uh, higher rate limit so that it processes jobs at uh, at uh, uh, high intervals. But uh, two queues who have the same interval, there's no priority. I mean, there is no uh, uh, th there is no factor which determines this queue is more important than this queue. The only factor which determines uh, which queue to which, which queue uh, to pick the job from is based on the rate limit. Okay, so so in uh, so in that scenario, instead of um, making user level queues, you can uh, create uh, queues based on the priority. So you can say uh, this queue will have 30 uh, as the rate limit and uh, 30 jobs per second, or this queue will have uh, 40 jobs per second, depending on the uh, uh, job or or the message type. So you can probably use that. Or what you can do is you can, if you want to have both, like if you want to even have this and have that, then you can chain the queues. So chain the queues in the sense uh, it's a way by which uh, you can have uh, so it basically uh, is rate limited on a particular uh, way where uh, uh, it 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 is dequeued at this uh, it is dequeued at this uh, queue uh, uh, based on the based on the user and then probably you can uh, put it in another queue if it is going out to a third party service provider um, based on that particular rate limit so you can just re enqueue it back with different uh, queue ID which is the yeah, probably, yes. Okay, so I'll answer the second one first. So about the IP address, right? I mean, it depends on how you deploy it. So <coughs> if if all of them are in the same, uh, let's let's say you're deploying it on AWS and all of them are in the same uh, zone or all of them are in the same region, then you can probably uh, be done with uh, private IP addresses which AWS gives the FQDMs which they give so that it can uh, route via the 
private network itself and uh, the question about uh, what happens if there is no finish request right so uh, shark can be configured in a way where you can set an interval saying if there is no uh, finish request uh, coming from the worker before this time then requeue the job back so what shark does is wait for that time and sees if the finish request comes if it doesn't pulls out the job from uh, i mean its internal data structure and puts it back into that queue so that it can be dequeued again by uh, any other worker yeah okay guys thank you uh, maybe we can uh, catch up post lunch we can discuss more thanks thank you sandeep uh, we have lunch available uh, we'll resume